I, for various reasons, like the idea of portfolios that are this short. Um, I think they give something to people that's more interesting and they act very differently to the market. I find the states, you know, contrary to market positioning and sort of recent performance, I find the US very, very troubling and very, very, very problematic. This idea of an unstoppable bull market in dollars is actually not true. The shale industry doesn't keep oil prices suppressed. It's actually, I think, about to become something that actually keeps the prices high. Hello, I'm Roger from Real Vision, and today we're going to interview Russell Clark of Horseman Capital. Many of you may recall we interviewed Russell um, just over a year ago. Raoul um, spent some time with him and they discussed a whole range of topics. And it was an interview that was probably one of the ones I enjoyed most from last year, covering shale, covering portfolio construction and what it was like to be a short seller. So we're here today to catch up on his thoughts, to see where he is on hopefully things like shale, see what else he's looking at, uh, what are the main kind of drivers of his thought process at the moment, and maybe get a little bit more on, on how he builds his, his portfolios and how he looks at the world. So I'm very excited to be here. I'm looking forward to this interview and hopefully we'll get a lot out of it on those fronts. Russell, welcome back to Real Vision. Ah, thanks for having me. It's, uh, I think it was summer of 2017, you were last on. Ah, uh, yep. And That's you right. covered a, a lot of topics in quite a lot of detail. It was a fascinating interview. There was a couple of pieces of unfinished business, which hopefully we'll touch upon um, later. But I think one of the things that resonated with me and with a lot of subscribers was you talked about matching the macro with the micro. And I was just wondering, sort of maybe just sort of filling in over the last um, 18 months, where do you see the macro today? And how have you managed the transition in macro over that period? Yeah, uh, well, it's true. Uh, you know, when I think, uh, when I was talking last time, you know, the area I was starting to really look into was US shale, where you had a sort of big disconnect between valuations and cash flow. And, you know, what's sort of very typical for me is that you look at something, you like build a couple of spreadsheets, doesn't quite fit together. So you leave it, you go do something else and you come back and look at it again. And you know, slowly you start to build up an idea of how that industry works and how it could go wrong or might go wrong or how it might get better and what you should be doing with it. And you know, it sort of feels, I think now with, you know, partly having looked at it, but also seeing some more data points come out, it sort of makes a lot more sense to me. Um, has been, it's one of those areas when you look at it, it's very, um, it's funny how different people from different angles see it completely different. And it's, I still have gone to a level where I think I understand why people are like that, um, which I'm happy to talk about more if you like. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to, if you can explain what the differences are, because this is, it is one that certainly bifurcates our audience. So I'd love to hear how you see that bifurcated yeah. viewpoint. Um, so the thing is like, you know, so I've, you know, I have written some stuff that's sort of basically not, not particularly bearish on shale per se, just saying that I don't think production in the US can grow much more than here from where it is today. Um, and, you know, when I've published that sort of stuff, you know, you do get this sort of negative feedback, essentially saying you don't really understand shale, there's like unlimited potential, unlimited number of wells that can be pushed out. And what I sort of realized when I looked at it is that if you have bought the land and you've drilled it and you've got this high initial production, so bigger IP, which they all talk about, it actually totally makes sense for you to go drill that and get that cash out and you will have a very, very high IR. And so for everyone who's doing that, they can't see any problem. And that makes total sense to me. So that's normally the where the negative fee com feedback comes from because they you know, they're going, well, this guy's saying the US oil industry is, you know, done. Whereas the wells I've got all look fantastic. So, you know, there's that big disconnect. And I think the problem is, is that you have to look at it from a business perspective. Now, if you are a listed oil producer in the States, you have to show growing production and growing reserves, all right? If you don't, your valuation drops down, you become subject to a takeover. Uh, potential takeover or other things like that. 
And so for all the listed companies, I think this includes the integrators, it's very important for them to show growing production and growing reserves. Now the problem with shale from a business perspective is that let's say you're targeting you know, 100,000 or you know, 100,000 uh, 100, barrels of oil day production. Now because of the huge drop off, that means you need to keep drilling, right? And so from a business perspective, you're not just looking at the IRR of that one well, you're looking at the IRR of maintaining production over time. Now, what you get with shale is you've got to drill, get it out, and then move and drill another place. And so the mystery factor and the, I think where the analysis changes from, from my perspective to sort of the more bullish people is that the cost of buying the land is very, very high, particularly in the Permian where all the drilling is done. And so when you add in the cost of land, if you have to buy new land, it doesn't make sense. The, the cost of maintaining production at 100,000 barrels a day is too high. And so actually the fully loaded cost return in the States is low. And what's interesting for me is over the last couple of years, what you've seen is that land costs in the States have continued to rally. Uh, and they've gone up substantially. So the best way to have played that, uh, and I wish I had owned it, was a, is like a stock called Texas Specific Land, which is up you know, thousand, thousands of percent because all it does is own land and then leases it out to operators. The operators have not followed because in essence, their drilling programs, from my perspective, are really transfers of wealth from the suppliers of capital to the landowners. And because lands become expensive and the other drilling nations of the world, so oil nations of the world, so Russia, Canada, these places have all seen their currencies depreciate. You actually, when you include the land costs, the US is not as cost effective as it was. And so what you're beginning to see is drilling is moving away from the states to other areas. And what's intriguing about this is if you, so if, you, if that analysis makes sense, you know, you look at the big drillers and you think, well, you know, if they want to drill in the States, what do they have to do? How are they going to control this cost? And what you're starting to see from my, what you've seen this year anyway, is two of the big sort of Permian uh, pure plays have merged with other pure plays. So Contra has bought uh, RSP Permian and, Enig uh, and Pioneer bought Enigan, uh, both pretty large deals. Those were both all share deals. There's no cash. So these big producers are saying, okay, let's get together. I think you know, what they're trying to do is try and consolidate it so they can take pressure off, the, uh, off buying land to get the price down so they can make a recent, decent return. And it's very interesting when you sort of think about the US shale industry, the way I think about it is it's, it's, um, it's sort of like when you look at retail and then retail malls, okay? So a mall, a mall operator it's not really a retailer, it's a landlord that's dependent on the retail industry. And when I look at a lot of like the uh, sort of private equity shale drillers, and they are a big part of that uh, business, they're not really drillers, they're landlords that are reliant on the oil industry. And because of the nature of the business where these drillers have needed to use so much capital, what you've seen is that the private equity uh, guys what they do is they come consolidate the land and they sell it to the drillers and made huge returns. Yeah, you know, that because they have dominated the high return business, which is what they do. And the buyers of those lands have suffered. Now everyone will say, oh, Pioneer or EOG or you know, Conscious done really well. That is true, ish. Uh, but if you go and look at like a long tail of you know, sort of subpar producers, a lot of them have done very, very badly because they've had to continually raise capital. And so what you've got is this sort of transfer of capital to landowners, which includes a lot of private equity. Um, and I think from what I read, and what, the way I'm looking at it, that, that, that sort of business is beginning to slow. Uh, and the sort of oil operators have sort of wisened up to that deal. So they buy the land themselves directly, much less likely to buy from private equity. So one of the interesting things that we're starting to see, which makes me feel like that might be true, is that there's like a, a, a new, uh, so one of the things I always do is, you know, just to make sure I'm not wrong, because if you get a new Permian coming along, then US oil production will take off. Uh, so I was looking at this new sort of, 
maybe New Permian uh, called the Austin Chalk, uh, which is actually sort of south Eagle Ford area. Um, and what you see is a lot of private equity guys there. Some of the big players have brought land there. Now, what was fascinating is one of these private equity companies couldn't find anyone to buy the land. So they set up a special purpose acquisition company, listed it. It then raised capital to buy the land from the private equity at big evaluations. So it's almost like they've created their own demand through making a company. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the history of that type of uh, financial stuff is mixed, to say the least. But it's a sign that I think the market is changing. And so one of the reasons why I think US oil production uh, could slow is, you know, for two reasons. One is I think it's cheaper to, to drill when you look at the whole cost of capex over time, it is now cheaper to, to get oil out uh, in the old traditional places like Russia and Canada. And you're starting to see some activity that way. And the second thing is because of the nature of decline in shale, if you start to slow capex, oil production drops because the, the decline picks up. And so those pieces all seem to be pretty falling into place from my mind. Um, and I think, you know, by looking at it that way, it explains the sort of very different views people get. And do you feel there's any issues around the leverage? Because this was always seen, you know, the oil industry was seen as being quite leveraged. But when we had the oil price drop in 2014-15, yeah. um, there was a lot of credit was extended because credit was basically free back then. And now was the, the cost of capital has changed. Will there be as much easy credit this time around if we see a reduction in oil prices now. We're not going to comment on the oil price, but yeah. if that happened, or is it just the whole change in the way that the cost of capital, is that going to have an impact? You know, so, so the way I look at it is like, uh, so when you're doing shale drilling, gas is very easy to understand because the decline rate's much lower. Uh, it's much more similar to sort of gas elsewhere. Now the oil, in the first stage of the shale oil boom, no one really quite understood the, uh, the uh, you know the decline rates and the geography of this thing, so it was a little bit hard to financially model. Um, and so what you just had was a classic boom. Everyone got involved and tried to work out how this works because you, what you do see is they they have done a really good job in getting costs down. And this is one thing I probably should have mentioned. I w should have mentioned earlier is what's interesting now is because a lot of the US oil production is now out of the Permian and what they call the Koi area, one of the issues people have had historically is this idea of um, frack hits or interference between wells. Now, actually, I think prior to the Permian, it probably wasn't much of an issue because they tended to have much more land and drilled further away from each other. What you've seen in the Permian is they've tried to maximize the efficiency in a much smaller region and so what you read is that frack hits are rising or the sort of interference is rising because the drillers are deliberately trying to absolutely get every last drop of oil out from the land that they've got. And so they actually sort of keep pushing it and pushing it until they hit that wall. And the signs from like the data you get from the EIA and other places is that they've hit that wall. And so I think what's happened for everyone, me, you know, so the outside investors, some of the big integrated other guys, is we, they've, they've worked out the economics of this now. And I think the issue they've got now is that the land prices, I think, in the Permian are too high to continue the drilling. Now, you know, if they can find other basins where the land's cheap, then, and then US oil production can keep going. But at the moment, they need to resolve this issue that growing production is not going to work. Um, and I also think now what you're seeing is, you know, they're deliberately trying to reduce their capex needs, which is why you've seen the uh, land holdings of most oil listed uh, shale producers that I see have actually declined. So they're selling off non-core assets to maximize a uh, return on capital. Um, so, you know, the industry there is under flux, but it sort of makes sense to me and it's much easier to model. And it leads to some very contradictory conclusions to what the market thinks. Uh, would you like me to talk about it? Or? Love to, yes. Because I mean, last time when you talked about it, you said, in, I'm building my thesis and I think it'll look exciting in yeah. one to two years' time. So here we are between one and two years. Yeah. On. Is this now the time? Yeah, I think so. Um, so what I think is the big sort of 
contrary conclusion to the shale is that the view is because it's like what they call the fast turn oil business is that it will actually suppress oil prices. So if oil prices rise too much, it'll come in, production will suddenly increase and then prices will fall down again. I actually think it's almost the opposite. Um, because of the structure of the industry where the landowners keep pushing up prices and they know you have to buy and there's this sort of tension. And because it's increased so much, you have a natural decline of about 500,000 barrels a year now. If they stop drilling in the States, actually drop more than that, it'd be like six, 700,000 barrels would drop uh, out of US production straight away. That's quite a lot of oil, right? That just drops out and needs to be replaced. And so actually the shale industry doesn't keep oil prices suppressed, it's actually, I think, about to become something that actually keeps the prices high. If you think, uh, if you think about how shale has transformed legacy decline, so in the old days before shale, you used to have to replace, you know, 50, you know, 100,000 maybe barrels of oil a year. Uh, now you have to replace 600, right? That doesn't suppress prices, it actually raises them up. And so, the biggest disconnect then in the market, and at the moment, you know, it's it makes sense because there's a lot, there's excess production in the states. It's hard to get out, but it would suggestive to me that the spread between uh, WTI and Brent will actually move closer over time, rather than widen, which is the current assumptions. Um, and if that's correct, you know, it adds lots of. Uh, very interesting dynamics to how markets will work going forward. Where do you think that will go? Because I think we got to sort of over 20 a few years ago, then yeah. went almost back to zero, but it's been rising again in the last Correct. six months or so. Yeah. Where does it go to? Well, I think the spread goes back to zero, right. to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and there's, I think, that partly because the, also the industry is consolidated a lot, so you don't have as many new producers coming in. It's hard to raise capital. So the supply, I think, will be more controlled. And you're starting to see, you know, so I would, and also because the legacy decline is so high, it's much easier for production to drop down. Uh, and so, you know, I think over time you'll see that spread come in. You know, I normally don't like to make predictions like that, but what you've seen in the market is if you look at like the, not the oil companies, which are very uh, correlated to oil price, but you look at the oil uh, drilling service companies. So you look at like frac sand stocks, so uh, most famous ones probably U.S. Silica, for example, stocks down fifty percent this year. Earnings have been good. There's new. There is some competition coming in on other stuff like that. But you look at the, the other service companies like Sombajay and those sort of stocks. They're also down. They're completely disconnected from the oil price. And you have to ask yourself why is that? Why is if activity is great and the shale is going to keep booming, why are the sand stocks in the floor? Why are the service companies in the floor? Because they, you know, stocks always move for a reason. Uh, we often ignore them because we don't want to accept the reason for them moving, and because that would they imply we have to change our view on everything. As you see it all the time, people don't people don't want to accept what a stocks telling them, you know, uh, and so they just ignore it. Uh, but if you look at what U.S. sort of oil service companies are saying, they're saying there's a slowdown coming, and it makes total sense. And then if you look at, and once you accept that, you see evidence of that uh, everywhere. You're starting to see international rig count rise after years of decline. You're starting to see more uh, M&A activity in even the tar sands in Canada. So, you know, everything's pointing to a, an inflection in the way the oil market works uh, from how we've now understood it. And sort of moving on to one of your other um, areas that you've been looking at, I guess, because we, we sort of, um, this is a thesis that's obviously been drawn out over the last um, two, 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 three years, and you've been building it. Yeah. Um, one of your other views, or one of the other theses that you've been looking at, is, is in the semiconductors. Where's your thesis lying on those? I'm a creature of habit, sadly. So whenever I see the same sort of signs, I always think, uh oh, something's starting to look different and interesting here. It's time to sort of look at it more carefully. And the most simplest thing is, is uh, if you see new competitors coming into an industry, almost certainly returns are going to decline. Uh, and then you just need to look at whether those competitors are credible, you know, other sort of barriers to entry and stuff. Um, 
And so we're always looking at all different industries. We're always keeping an eye on new competitors coming in or competitors leaving. And so with semiconductors, you know, we started looking at this last year, um, you know, and there's been a lot of hoo-ha and talk about the made in China in 2025. And they've been throwing money at the semiconductor industry. Um, and they're building huge fabs. It's very hard to find uh, pictures of them. They're massive. The amount of capex is huge. Um, and so all the sort of pieces are there. Now, the big bull argument for semis has been that uh, getting the expertise and the know-how to compete at the cutting edge takes years and years of operation. And that is true. You've seen many companies try and come, come in and compete with the big, big boys like the TSMCs, Intels, Samsungs, whoever, uh, Nvidia's, all these guys, Nvidia's more into chip design, but you know, and they, they can't, it takes, it's true, it does take years of competition, uh, years of uh, you know, operating and competing to, to catch up to those guys, that is true. But we'd been looking at it for a while and then we were just reading uh, the results from Applied Materials, which is a semiconductor equipment company, which has been booming because everyone's buying equipment. And what's really struck me that interestingly about this, it was in the most recent quarterly results, so they said, we actually sell more old equipment, what they call lagging, than we do leading. And, you know, and they, they even give you historically, they say, you know, it used to be 80% new equipment, 20% old equipment, which sort of makes sense to me. Semiconductor industry is a bit like a shark. If, it's not, if it doesn't move forward, it's gonna die. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, why would you, why would you buy an old semiconductor? It doesn't make any sense. And so I looked into it, and what you find is that uh, what's happened over the last few years is demand for uh, old products like sensors, so stuff that takes real world information and changes it into digital. So for cars or internet of things, that sort of stuff has been booming. And so the legacy producers of those, of those products who have fully depreciated fabs have just minted money. And the, the, the sort of flip side of that is that new semiconductor technology, the sort of lower uh, geometry stuff is so expensive, no one actually can make money from it. And so what's happened is the industry has gone great. You know, everyone wants the old stuff. We can't make money from new stuff anyway. We're just gonna make more old stuff. And because it's old, it's, you know, they make huge returns on it. So the guys who have existing fully depreciated fabs make good money, even new guys have made money. And so once we saw that, it's suddenly the argument from the bulls that China can't compete at the sort of cutting edge technology just falls apart because all of the profitability is in the old stuff, which no one says they can't compete in. They just got to build it and they are building it. And so once you sort of have that in place, you, for me, it was quite easy to just sort of start thinking about what areas were going to be weak and what areas going to be, you know, were not necessarily going to be weak. So, um, and to be honest with you, sometimes, and this is something I was just saying to you before, and one thing I would like to do is just sort of give people an idea of how you can research yourself. Um, and so once you realize that, you know, you want to be looking at the companies with old technology, you go to Wikipedia, <laughs> Yeah, Wikipedia. And then uh, they have a huge list of all the fabs ever built. You can then copy and paste into an Excel spreadsheet and then you sort it by, so older fabs are 200 millimeters or lower. New fabs are 300, some are 400, but 300 is new. So you just sort of sort it by ascending uh, numerical ascending order. And that size is that when you millimeters actually is millimeters? Uh, so you got two things in, so it's a weird, semiconductors are a bit confusing, not that confusing, but so uh, you got the wafer, the bigger the wafer, the more efficiencies, but it's a little bit hard to make. So the wafers get bigger as they get more efficient. Now, as they develop the technologies, they can cut those wafers finer, they can etch into them finer and finer lines. And that's like nanometers and the lower is better. Okay, so what I'm talking about with the, the fabs is you want the fabs with the smaller wafers are uh, lagging technology. Does that make sense? Yes, I yeah. can see that, yes. Uh, it's a little bit confusing, not complicated, but confusing. So you then, I went and looked at every company that is running a old fab and 
then went and looked at their performance in the market. And once you did that, it suddenly became super clear where the weakness in semiconductors is gonna be. It's gonna be in the guys that have made huge amounts of money from these old fabs. Uh, and that sort of is really what's played itself out. You've seen a lot more weakness in semis and it's being concentrated in the older sort of sensor orientated uh, semiconductor market. Um, normally when I, when I look at a market like that, what I assume is if, you, if the industry is blowing up one part of it, that will happen for a while and then slowly the weakness will bleed up as companies go, oh, there's no profitability in this anymore. We need to move all our investment to where there, where there is some profitability and then that, that blows up the tightness and everything collapses. But at the moment, it's still the weakness. With, with the portfolio construction, I guess, you know, we've heard a lot about you know your your long side. Yep. Um, I'd love you to talk about how that's evolved over time. You've got to have a lot of positions. Some will be winners, some won't be winners. Yep. It's all about sizing. It's all about what's on the other side. So putting all that together, how do you build, how does anybody build an efficient, I don't, I don't want to use that in the efficient portfolio theory style, but yep. a comfortable portfolio that you can sleep at night with? I think for you know anyone who's thinking about portfolio construction, uh, or even investments in general. I, you know, what I like is to have what I call like tent poles. You know, big ideas that you really believe in, and that you can use market data to confirm on a real time basis. Um, and you know that that I think is what's really important. If you don't have those, you won't know. You can't test if your theory is right, and you also won't know when to sell. Um, I've seen many, many. Fabulous investors who are fantastic at buying, really bad at selling, because um, they buy it. it. One of the funny thing about markets is that uh, when you have a really successful position that's made you a lot of money or being very successful for you, it's almost like there's this meld where you become the stock, uh, it, it, and no sort of objective conversation is possible anymore. Uh, and that's typically when that stock starts to crash. And on both sides of the internet. So when yeah. you've got a winner and when you've got a loser, at what point do you go, I'll cash that in, or my thesis is wrong, rather than just, oh, it's not working right now, but maybe it's wrong. So on both sides. Exactly. So that's why you need to have like, a, you know, sort of understand the industry and build real-time indicators that will confirm or reject your hypothesis and then give you a good idea um, for, you know, what to do. Um, and so, you know, and that, so before you can do anything, you need to build those two sort of types of, uh, um, what I call, yeah, like tent poles. So if we're talking about, you know, how to construct a portfolio now in the sort of the methods that I like. Now, I, for various reasons, like the idea of portfolios that are this short. Um, I think they give something to people that's more interesting and they act very differently to the market. And it also gets away from one of the big problems in the market is everyone has the same trades on, uh, which has been exacerbated by ETFs and other things. Um, so what I try and do is look, look at the views I have and start with looking at well, what sectors are going to suffer. And in particular, what sectors that everyone owns is going to suffer. So semiconductor is one we've already talked about, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Then we look at like the other theory which we just talked about, which is, I think, oil price is going to go up, that shale is not going to act as a suppressor to oil price. In fact, if anything, it's going to act as a, something that pushes it up because it's increasing the decline rate of oil in general. And so you go, okay, so we think oil prices go higher. Uh, we're not really enamored with the US oil industry so much. So, uh, you know, we, we think US prices probably rise higher than oil prices. Okay, so what does that historically mean? So historically, you look at the so US consumer and they generally don't like high oil prices. So you start thinking about, you know, what sort of industries are connected to the US consumer. Uh, and in particular, is there industries that will join your oil view with your semiconductor view? And fortunately, there is. And the missing piece is autos. So you then look at the US auto industry, and it's an industry I've looked at for, for many years. Uh, you've had very high levels of auto debt. Um, you also see in the auto lending standards of, auto lending standards have sort of stayed stable, but what they've done is uh, when people have come to 
get a new car in the States, they often will be still uh, have debt outstanding on the car and they roll that new debt into the new car. So the sort of uh, amount of equity that people have in their car if they pay off in full has been declining. So it's a measure of lending stance and that's our sort of cyclical low. So you can see this, the potential for problems in the US auto sector and lending sector. And so, you know, you now have like three major areas in my view that I think are actually sort of interconnected in a, at some point. And so one of the, the way I like to uh, create a strategy is, is that you have different asset classes that will trade independent of each other. And so in a normal market condition, you, you don't really get much volatility. You know, you're sort of just moving around. But if your sort of thesis plays out, if it starts to come together, what you find is that the correlations between those assets are slowly going to be drawn together. And so your portfolio will then be able to generate high returns in a very unusual, very different to the rest of the market. What you find in the rest of the market will be all correlated to each other and you'll be correlated the other way. Um, and so that's sort of where we see it now. Uh, and it looks, you know, it looks very interesting. On the autos, are you looking at the, the actual US autos or the auto loan companies? And aren't there better opportunities to play the autos in some of the global names rather than the US names where there's not been as much movement yet? Because some of the US names are kind of down already. Globally, I think all the autos have problems. Um, what you see is there's a lot of debt um, the debt is sometimes at the auto loan companies. Other times it's held within the OEM, so the manufacturer of them. Uh, and there's a lot of contingent liability there because often they do a lot of secondhand cars to, uh, where they promise to buy back or a lot of leasing. Um, and so, you know, when you look at the debts, like actually the old legacy producers um, that have a lot of that, to me, it looks like the whole auto industry looks very problematic. And in terms of your kind of looking at the hedges and stuff, um, two, three years ago, fixed income was one of your hedges. Yeah. This sounds inflationary, but it also sounds economic stagnation as well, potentially. So yeah. currently, where, where do you view the bond world? Bonds are very tricky. Uh, very tri I, normally, historically, I like them. Because uh, there's so much debt, it's very hard to see interest rates go up a lot because you start getting into real problems of the interest expense and other things like that. I find the states, you know, contrary to market positioning and sort of recent performance, I find the US very, very troubling and very, very, very problematic, um, super problematic. The weird thing about this industry is that, you know, especially with like hedge funds and that sort of stuff, people always think, oh, there's like some magic stuff. And, you know, when you look at all the big trades, it's like, uh, US houses are too expensive, so we sure sure guys who lent against them. And it's like, I mean, is that that hard? Or uh, oil price was like 120, and lots of production was coming on. So now it, it fell. I mean, these are not mystery trades. It's just that they've continued for so long. People have just sort of accepted that they're part of the wallpaper or something like that. Um, so the US is a you know I find that truly extraordinary in that. If you look at the US economy now, you got all time highs or, you know, all time highs in the stock market, more or less, been strong property markets, unbelievably great employment uh, numbers. I mean, fantastic. Now, if you told me all that and then said, uh, Russell, what do you think uh, US fiscal deficit would be? Well, I go, well, you know, back in the dot com bubble days, you know, they ran a 2% surplus. Uh, so, you know, let's say 2% surplus again. And you go, oh no, it's like a four and a half percent deficit. What? What happens if there's a recession? You know, what happens if you know something goes wrong? Who knows what? You know, something could you know, you know, and people suddenly you know decide not to go out. You know, whatever. You sort of sort of slow it down. You're talking like six, seven percent, eight percent. And on top of that, you know, you know, with the trade war, you're actually getting rid of buyers for treasuries, right? You know, China is, was the biggest buyer of treasuries. So it doesn't make any sense to me, right? Um, and so I really dislike the US dollar. And the reason I say dollar and not treasuries is that unfortunately Ben Bernanke 
uh, and to be fair, it was a Bank of Japan startup at a much smaller scale, uh, has created this idea that central banks buying fixed income or government debt is a good thing. What you've seen with is in the US is exactly what you would expect to happen, is that if you go to a borrower and say, don't worry, you borrow as much as you want and I will backstop it, they're going to borrow more and there's never going to be an end to it. And that's really where we are with the states, you know. But doesn't this become, I mean, it's an incredibly difficult environment because if you look at the world today and if you talk to them, you know, the US investor, they go, equities in a bull market because the US has been in this wonderful rally with a couple of you know, yep. well-defined well blips. Yep. Uh, the rest of the world, uh, particularly emerging markets, are struggling. We've got divergent central banks, yep. but they're div diverging from a path that's been hewn from the same economic storybook. Yep. Um, and it looks like the world's in transition, but the US has frustrated every bear out there because it looks like capital's being sucked back into the US. Yep. And I guess it goes back to this sort of point with, with the difficulties of being a contrarian and hence the portfolio being so important in construction. The world has sort of become one framework for investing yep. because central bankers have defined one path. Yep. We've got rules-based investing, which is now following that, and the money is flowing from active to, to the passive world, which means that it becomes harder and harder to hold a contrarian view against the enormity of this, this big structure. So therefore, kind of touching on it earlier, the, the carry cost of a contrarian viewpoint can be quite expensive over the long term, but presumably that's because you think that the rewards, when it finally turns, can be much, much higher. So how, how do you kind of deal with that? I must say, I dislike the term contrarian because it makes me, it makes it sound like, oh, I like it. No, I hate that. Oh, okay, I hate it. No, now I like it. That's not how I work. Um, what I do is I, what I always, you know, the ways that really work for me is to really understand the industry really well and then work out what's going to happen to that industry with me, you know, as much certainty as you can get and then work from that and look at where investors are positioned incorrectly and either long or, or, or short or whatever, and to take advantage of that. Now, I have always disagreed with the central bank drive market narrative. Um, you know, if you look back at the housing bubble, Bernanke went out of his way to try and stop it, didn't happen. You know, the market had to take it out. You look at what happened to, you know, people when, when the US first started QE, said commodities is gonna go up forever, gold is gonna go up forever, and that's how they invested, and the business cycle came along and destroyed them and took all their money away, right? And so the idea that now US equities will be in a lifelong bubble that will never collapse, of course, is crazy. Um, and the thing is, as soon as someone says there's a bubble or a mania or whatever, it's not, all right? There's always a good rational reason for why something is trading the way it is. The, the issue is that either most people don't know or you just haven't worked it out yet. And one of the things I probably, you know, which I didn't talk about when I was talking about the shale, is I did come to this realization. Um, so he, when I looked at the first time I looked at shale and started to understand its uh, size and the implications, is I took a very negative, I took the way to invest, I took a sort of more negative way, which is my natural sort of way of doing things, which is like, these shale guys are going to destroy the Russians, they're going to destroy the Saudis, they're going to destroy Canada and everyone else. And there was a way to monetize that that worked really well. Now, let's say if I was more bullishly constructed, uh, you know, what would have been the trade? At the time, I was very long. Uh, well, at the time, I was very bullish on emerging markets and, and oil producers. But if I'd suddenly seen that, what I would have done uh, is I would have dumped any sort of emerging market oil producer I had. And especially during the financial crisis, I would have gone out of my way to buy every sort of US asset that would benefit from the growth in shale, uh, gas, and oil. And I probably would avoid the producers because of uncertainty of prices when you have a huge production growth. And I've been very bullish on the US going forward. Do you know, do you know how many macro investors did that? I don't. There's one. One. One, but he's not known as a macro investor. It's Warren Buffett. Now people don't remember this, but Warren Buffett was like the biggest foreign shareholder of PetroChina, which suddenly he dumped in 2007 or early 08. And if you remember correctly, well, I remember, because I, I could never understand what he was doing for ages. He went out and bought 
BSNF, which is a big rail company. He owns loads of pipelines. He also owns loads of utilities. All of these companies have benefited massively from the growth uh, in US shale and oil production. And so, you know, for a long time, I always thought Warren Buffett was a genius businessman because of the structure of his business where he never has to give any money back, which is, if you ever worked in the investment management industry, is like the... It's a dream. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a dream. Yeah. Not it's, having redemptions when there's right time to buy. Drawdown's less important. That's just a fantastic model. But uh, having really looked at shale carefully, I've changed my opinion. Not only is a brilliant businessman, he's also a brilliant macro investor. And now uh, I know he's known as a value investor, but in my book, he smashed the macro. He really understood it and he went in with size. And even funnier, he told everyone exactly what he's doing. He didn't even sort of explain the shale, but he said, you know, back in sort of 08, 09, when everyone was depressed, he said the best days are ahead for the US. And I really respect that. You know, you see a trade like that comes along every now and then and you commit big amounts of money and size. And I like that. And I think I remember we, we were talking about derivatives. I think he went and sold long dated puts yeah. on the S&P yeah. in 08 or 09. Well, great trade. Well, if you also think, yeah, I mean, because at the time we had very high oil prices. So if you know that energy prices are going to be lower over the next 10 years, the chances that equity is going to do well are very, very high, which is exactly what happened in the 70s, high oil prices, and over the 80s and 90s they fell, equities did very well. And so it's been a fantastic trade. The issue I have with it now is that it looks to me like it's reversing because because all of the investment in oil and gas has gone into North America, into the onshore, and actually growth, to, from my perspective, now this is where I could be wrong, but from my perspective, growth out of the state is going to be weak and expected. So higher oil prices seem more likely. Um, and typically higher oil prices are not great for equities and normally not great for bonds. Because this time around, it'll go back to the old, the classic thing on oil is yeah. it's a tax on the consumer. Now there's that period where it was actually driving so much capex that yeah. the, the, the knock-on effect of that was was for the whole economy. But today, that's kind of reversed. So the, we're back to the old style, higher oil, less money in your back pocket. Well, it comes back to my very negative view on the States because you could get an environment where you have higher US oil prices, but less US activity and less US production. Mm. If you think about how negative that would be, um, I find the US dollar the most unattractive currency I've ever seen in my life. And I'd, lo I'd love to hear a little <laughs> bit more of that thesis because I kind of look at the offshore market. I think there's the offshore market being the international okay. kind of short dollar, which is dollar denominated debt. Yep. And the sucking out of, of you know, it's trade falls, there's fewer dollars in circulation as the US repatriates capital. Okay. So you've got this, it's almost like a structural short, which is at risk of a slowdown in, in volume of trade. Yep versus the bigger, longer-term structural story that the US loses hegemony, but that's a kind of a slow-burning story. Is, is it within that, or is it a completely different reason? Absolutely. So again, this is where uh, I think macro investors would really benefit from digging a little bit deeper. So there is a lot of dollar debt uh, globally, right? So in Brazil, Russia, other places. Do you know where the you know, majority of that is with corporates now? Most governments don't borrow in dollars, with some, ex some exceptions like uh, Argentina, but that is a particularly badly run economy and very small these days. So most of the dollar debt's held with corporates. What do you think the, uh, the, the dominant type of corporate that owns dollar debt in emerging markets is? Commodity types? Yeah, almost all oil and gas actually. Right. Uh, the miners have very little dollar debt. It's very hard for me to really buy into, uh, there's gonna be a lack of dollars for offshore oil and gas producers to get their hands on. One of the, so I've write these sort of pay, you know, market views that we, we freely distribute. And you know, way back in 2012, I wrote a note basically saying, Brazil's head for a fiscal crisis, so sell everything. Uh, I remember going to Brazil and saying this to Brazilians, I'm like, ah, it's fine. But you know, the numbers were very, you could see Petrobras so dominate, dominated their economy and their tax revenue, and you knew Petrobras was in trouble, you know, it was very easy, and you knew there was shale, it was very easy to see the put two and two together. Petrobras looks all right to me now, you know? I mean, you know they can cut a lot of costs because they had a lot of corruption in the first place, so that's coming out. Uh, production looks to be better. You know, so it's very hard for me to buy into Brazil's about to blow up again when it's sort of major corporate 
looks all right. Now, of course, this is a recession. Everyone's in trouble. But uh, I really don't buy into the dollar shortage story. And so with this move that we're currently having in terms of there's a bit of turmoil in emerging markets. Sure. Are you looking at that as you kind of getting yourself ready to, to buy into that? Because it sounds like what you're thinking here is we're in the turmoil in emerging markets. Yep. They're selling off. You're going to buy that and be sort of structurally mentally short the US, but in certain pockets that you think get hit by the micro. What I find fascinating about emerging markets. Um, so one of the great things about uh, ETFs is they've actually increased transparency in the market. So when people look at, so when most people talk about emerging markets these days, they talk about the EEM ETF, right? Mm, MSCI Emerging Markets. Uh, which is yeah. supposed to track MSCI yes. Emerging Markets, right? So. Uh, you know, back when I started, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough. It was always a chore and you had to pay money to MSCI to get the weightings. So when I first started, we had a long only product. So you would like, oh, I'm going to add 1% to whatever, you know, overweight. Yeah, so if you didn't know what the stocks were, you didn't know what to overweight. Um, now, one of the great things about these ETFs is because they rebalance all the time, you don't need to pay MSCI anymore. You just go look at the holding holdings of these ETFs and you can see the weightings, all right? So free tip for anyone who's interested and don't want to pay MSCI money, just look at the weightings of these ETFs. You know, by definition, they're going to match. So back, uh, you know, back to the 2007, 8, even 11, 12, if you looked at the EEM, you know, the top 10 would have five commodity stocks, be it Gazprom, Petrobras. Commodity index, absolutely. Commodity index. Yes. Now the top four stocks are all tech stocks. Yes. So. If EM is falling now, is it falling because oil and gas prices are falling or is it falling because Tencent doesn't make any money anymore? And if Tencent doesn't make any money, what does that really got to do with Brazil or Russia? Nothing. And in fact, if you look at Russian index and take out uh, two stocks, which is Petrobras and Gazprom, which is sort of affected by the US sanctions a little bit more and look at some of the old stalwarts of the Russian index, things like Luke Oil or even Novatech, they're at all-time highs. So how exactly does that match up with an EM crisis? You can see the inflection <laughs> point was um, when the Chinese really chucked chuck credit in in 2016. And going into 2016, yep. EM followed the commodity index down. Yep. And it followed the NASDAQ out up until, what, six months ago when the NASDAQ carried on up. Yep. And the EM turned over, which was effectively the tech side of EM coming yeah. into underperformance is mainly China. Also, the strong dollar historically is you know, very bad for EM as well. Um, but you do have a very unusual environment of strong dollar and strong oil prices, which is historically an anomaly. Um, so the, you know, the EM has created some strange price action, I'll agree. Um, but it seems to me, it's sort of, uh, I hate saying like a broken record, but when you look at like how the shale has transformed. So you know, back in 2007, US oil prices were higher than world prices, and now US oil prices are lower. And so the US has sucked in all this capital that used to go to Russia, used to go to Australia, used to go to Brazil, you know, all the sort of EM type assets. And what my analysis is saying is that that boom, FDI boom, is coming to an end, and that money is beginning to flow back out. And is that partly from, um, and again, going back to your last interview, you talked about Japan and Japan, Japanese investors yep. piling into the US. And also you've seen money coming out of the Eurozone. Um, so I think it was um, you know, Xi's Jinping as well, it's kind of driven money out of China. So you had Japanese investors, the classic savers, yep. um, China and Europe fleeing to the US. Yep. Where do you see the inflection point for the dollar really coming from? Because at the moment, it feels like we're still in this sort of sucking in because the rest of the world is is seeing their kind of PMIs dropping. The US is still seeing near record highs. It's still in that you know, phase of above 60. Yep. And you normally get nervous about US equities when you're heading back towards 50. Two things I would say there is that, uh, you know, the US dollar really peaked in 2015. Uh, yen topped out, what, 125 in 2015. Euro bottomed at like 105. So, you know, here we are, you know, what, two years later, two, three years later. And yen is now what one to the twelve thirteen. That's the level. Euro is one fifteen. Uh, even sterling's you know up off the lows. So this idea of an unstoppable bull market in dollars is actually not true. Um, 
even with all the interest rate increases. Um, and there's some good technical reasons for that. Now, against some of the more weaker emerging market currencies, definitely, uh, so Indian rupee, the countries with big capital, uh, current account deficits, and oil importers, although you know, you're starting to see even that begin to transition. So the, the dollar bull market is uh, not really that real, especially against the G10. And so that's the sort of the first thing I would say, it's not really being confirmed. Um, there are technical reasons why, strangely, the dollar weakens as short-term rates go up. Uh, so, and I'm sure I'm I'm sure one of your contributors already talked about hedging costs of buying treasuries. So as the curve flattens, it becomes unattractive, mm -hmm. and that's really been uh, a big issue for for Japanese investors. Now, the thing about uh, one of the things I try and do is look use uh, free data uh, from the BIS, uh, which I then manipulate a bit to sort of get an idea of where. Uh, there is mismatches within the financial system, currency mismatches, because I find historically they give you a good heads up on big currency moves. And again, this sort of comes back to what I was saying before, the US dollar, particularly the yen dollar exchange rate, comes up as a big, huge mismatch. Um, like a very extreme positioning, both sides. So Japanese investments, net investments, the US is all time high and US uh, acceptance of foreign assets or U.S. ownership of assets at all-time high. So, yeah, you know, it, to me, the yen, you know, wants to rally. And it's like the government sort of sets out to sort of suppress it because they know it causes problems. Uh, it's the same with the Swissy. You know, they, they're there to, to, to sort of suppress it. And it's sort of like the central banks have decided that it's very, very important for them to protect the corporate sector from their bad investments, right? You know, it just, it's like we have to socialize everyone else's mistakes, uh, particularly corporate sector's mistakes. I don't really quite understand why that is. Um, uh, I think the central banks are very misguided. I think they started out trying to do the right thing. Um, uh, but you know, again, to an, again, to the space where doesn't make any sense anymore, really. And historically, once oil prices start to rise, uh, and this is where it gets interesting, I think why we're starting to see a bit more volatility in the markets is that when the oil price rises, the political pressure to raise interest rates starts to ratchet up, particularly in Europe and Japan, countries that have both had experience with hyperinflation. Um, so that's why I think things are starting to shift. And it sort of feels a little bit like a classic late cycle move in oil, because oil has nearly always gone up prior to, I think, the last five or six recessions. Isn't there a risk that if, if we have a classic late cycle move, we then, um, when we get through the late cycle into effectively the recessionary environment, yep. it becomes a global correlation event, and pretty much everywhere is a higher beta than the US, so therefore everywhere else should sell off more than the US, because that's been the historical norm. Or do you think that this time, because all this money has been sucked in, that actually the US will have effectively a higher beta to the rest of the world on the way down? So for me, you know, what the sort of socialization of corporate mistakes has meant for developed markets is that the US corporates have borrowed at much cheaper rates than they should. Um, and they've used that to do share buybacks, industry consolidation, private equity stuff. And so the weakness in the U.S. is on uh, corporate credit, right, uh, and interest rates. And what we're seeing with this sort of hedging cost is that, um, strangely, the more short-term rates go up if the curve inverts, the less foreigners want to own U.S. Treasury. So there's a the risk for me in the states is really uh, the interest rate one, which sort of counterintuitively is. N could maybe be made worse if, if interest rates go up. Um, and with Europe and Japan, what I feel is a big risk is that they have become used to artificially cheap exchange rates, which amplifies their exporter earnings. And when you look at the current account surpluses in Europe, Japan, they're very large, historically very large. And so strangely, you have these two different risks that sort of almost meet together. So if let's say Japanese and European investors decide that, you know, a US running a five, 6% fiscal deficit is too much risk for them, 
and by the way, the Chinese, I think, have really come to this conclusion and they stopped buying treasuries. And so there's a buyer's strike on treasuries and the US becomes reliant on foreigners to buy it. You know, what's the right interest rate for that? I don't know, right? And if the Fed steps in to try and become a buyer, you know, then dollar collapses in my view. And so you, what you probably get, to be really honest with you, and this is what I think will happen, is that uh, I think the dollar will collapse. I think Euro and Yen will do very well. And the export side of those stock markets will collapse. So in nominal terms, I would say, yeah, foreign markets, will, Europe and Japan will do worse than the States. But in currency adjusted, it'd be about the same. So it sounds like, kind of going back to one of your early, early um, views, it sounds like we should be selling German autos. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, you'd be crazy to own them. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't I mean, think you, you want to murder them, don't you? Yeah, I don't think you need to. Them. I don't think you need to be that selective. Uh, yeah, almost all the all those stocks look troubled. Yes. Um, you know, it's one of those things, right? If you walk down the street, you know, London. Everyone's parked on the street in London. You still look at the cars and you go, you know, I know that. I know that everyone loves showing Tesla. I, I don't do anything with Tesla because you don't know. You don't know where the end, you know, he's, you know, you don't know what, 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 what this stock could be in the future. But when I walk down the street in London, it's very easy for me to imagine in 10 years that the Teslas are still there, but the Ford Focus isn't. Yeah. Or the Opal or the, you know, it's very easy for me to look at the car companies that everyone's cheap and value investors are buying and go, they won't exist, but the Tesla could. But the Tesla, for me, when I, think, when I think about Tesla, I worry it could be like the Blackberry of EVs. Like it shows us the way away from the Nokia, but it's not Apple, it's the Blackberry. So it sort of does well, but then it doesn't, but it Blaze, then moves Blazes on. the trail, but then gets left yeah. behind because everyone yeah. else sees the, sees the problems and, yeah. and adapts. In that perspective, the Nokia was a much better short than Blackberry in that case. Changing tax slightly, but Twice you've talked about data that's freely available. Ah, yes. And there's this, sure, this sounds like an opportunity because everyone sort of thinks, you know, oh, God, these guys have an edge. Yeah. But everyone on the, the investment side, they have an edge because they pay for research from big investment houses. But it sounds like you get a lot of your research just from the web. Yeah. So how, maybe explain to viewers what your data sources are that are freely available and how you manipulate and look at data to come up with investment theses that we can all do. Absolutely. Well, you know, when uh, when you guys go in touch to say, you know, do you want to do another interview? I just read the article in the New York Times. Uh, now I'm not sure if that subscriber is like comp that they talked about the, the, the 32 year old. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The 30 year old um, hedge fund on his own. But from some of the feedback I got from the last uh, interviews, definitely there's a lot of a lot of people who watch uh, Real Vision are people who are staying out and trying to develop. Uh, either of their career or to develop their own sort of investment process. And, you know, for me, that's something that I've, uh, I like trying to help people develop. I mean, I have my own sort of weird and wonderful way of doing things, uh, but I do spend a lot of time trying to help uh, people develop. And one of the things which I've always sort of tried to point out to people is that, you know, as, a, as someone who has spent, you know, most of their last 15 years reading uh, equity research and trying to make money from it, um, what you find is that primary sources of information, which is what everyone bases their stuff off, tends to be freely available. Um, you just gotta know what to look for. And so uh, one of the things I thought I might do is just sort of give people like four spreadsheets that have made me the most money in my life and they're free. Uh, the, the number one, spreadsheet, which is free, is the BP Oil Report. So if you, use, I think its full name is the BP Statistical Review. Now they produce as a PDF every year where they basically just talk about the energy markets, which include coal, natural gas, oil, and they talk about LNG, and they give you big, massive spreadsheet, which details oil production and consumption going back to the 60s for every country in the world. Um, and they do that for natural gas and all these other things. Now what's great about this is you can take this spreadsheet, download it, and then manipulate it, and do whatever you want with it, but you can then see trends very clearly. You can see where's growing, what's not growing, you know, where, where are the sort of trends in exports or imports. Um, and so for example, you know, one of the big uh, 
let's say, buy signs for coal, with well, so China's the world's biggest coal producer, but its production, its consumption increased so much in the sort of mid 2000s, it flipped from being an exporter to an importer. And at that point, coal prices and also shipping rates, Baltic dry shipping, you remember the Baltic dry boom? Probably not. It went not. insane. When, yeah. oh, that was a proper bubble. That, no, it wasn't. No, ah. it was very rational. Yeah, fair enough. Because <laughs> suddenly you had an exporter who became an importer of such size that the market couldn't keep up. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but I think the timing of the, the, the non-bubble, as it were, um, was it, in line with all the other... It did go bubbles. crazy, yes. It went crazy, and then it collapsed straight back down to its long-term average. So yes, it did, because it, the supply it like came a bubble, on. even if it wasn't. There are no, there are no bubbles. There's only mm -hmm. rational behavior. Okay. There's always rational behavior, but rational behavior, uh, so I was thinking about this, it's like, you know, you think it's a bubble, like, but, you know, take Netflix. Is Netflix a bubble? What I'll say to you is that Disney and all the other media conglomerates in the States are very, very afraid of Netflix, correct? Yes, correct. So it makes sense to price Netflix at a level where it has to get bought, where it's too expensive to buy, right? Or if they, you know, they have to pay up to buy it. And, you know, and if you start thinking that mentality, it's like, okay, yeah, Netflix doesn't make any money, but I know Disney wants to buy it. So if it, if it was only like a 10 billion, they'd buy it because it'd get rid of the competition. So I got to push it to 20. And so it always has this elevated, it was the same in the dot-com bubble. AOL was, you know, this competitor to the exact existing time, you know, existing producers. So they had to keep the valuation elevated until the bubble sort of, yeah, until they could take it out and then it collapsed down. And it's not irrational, it's just extreme, but that's how it always works. Yes. Um, uh, and, you just, and there are guys who are very good at playing that game. Better than me, I'll be honest with you. Um, so anyway, as the BP oil report, fantastic. Yeah. Um, every year I look forward to its publication. <laughs> it's very sad, <laughs> I know. And I get it, look at the data, manipulate it, look at what's happening. And again, the coal market is fascinating. So. Uh, previously a big exporter, uh, Indonesia, and also Vietnam, have now flipped to importers. And so coal for me, I feel like coal could be like the new tobacco. Do you know, so you remember like when cigarettes were discovered to be bad for you and everyone quit, tobacco stocks collapsed and everyone divested and then they became the best performing stocks for two decades, I think. I, I wonder if coal is the same thing. It's like, you know, everyone's divested and everyone hates coal, but... Uh, we're still going to be buying it, especially high quality coal. And you don't even need any new coal power plants to be built. There's just so many that are being built that uh, the demand is just going to rise and supply is not going to be there. I like coal, but... Uh, and that actually, all, is that on the, the, all comes in that BP report? Well, you have to do the analysis yeah. yourself, but it's yeah. there for free. Yeah. And when you go through a lot of the research like I do, it's always constantly being quoted by the, by the big investment banks because they take it as a source as well. And so that was one you said there was four. There was four, yeah. yeah so so the, other, the other one I really love, uh, this one's much harder to use, is the BIS uh, uh, International Banking Statistics. There's a big drop off in interest to that one, isn't <laughs> it? I know, uh, but basically what this will do, it's called the A1 table, and it just tells you uh, the foreign currency liabilities and the foreign currency assets of every banking system in the world. And what I tend to do with that one is just net them off and look at how they transform over time. And it's a great lead indicator on bubbles. Um, the, uh, the other spreadsheets I like, there's the FIDC, which is a US bank regulator. And that puts all the US bank details together, including number of banks operating, where they're lending the money to provisions, all algamated. So it gives you a real good heads up on uh, the US banking industry. And so if you're thinking about US banks, you can look at this and make a very sort of pretty good estimate of where you think profitability for the industry is going. And I think that really, really helps a lot. And so the, there is a, a fourth one, I think. Do you yes, know I just remembered it. It's um, so the Australian government, um, so you know, I'm from Australia and Australia, there's not much going on in Australia. We're not really a world leader in a lot, but we are in minerals and minerals exports. So the Australian government produces a great report on uh, commodities and the commodity markets. And strangely enough, uh, I think I said the BP report talks about coal. This Australian government, sort of Australian mineral export report, mineral report, something like that, uh, has a fantastic uh, detail on both the LNG and the coal markets. Um, and, you know, great sort of primary uh, resource for, 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 the, for research in these markets. So, you know, these are sort of... These are four areas I look at a lot on top of 
more slightly more boring uh, publications from IMF and World Bank, okay. which tend to give you some interesting <laughs> ideas. So they have actually let's keep the excitement going. They <laughs> have made me a lot of money historically. Yes. Uh, so these are all things that you know I think people should read. I, I always feel that for new investors, they're very inf easily influenced by opinions. Uh, opinions are meaningless, right? You want hard data, and then from hard data, you make your own opinions. And that's a much better way to develop your own sort of style and how you're gonna make money. And it's, it's kind of interesting that you kind of look at this sort of left field view on where you get data from. You obviously have a, I guess, this sort of investment style. If you're going against the grain and the momentum, you have to have a left field view on investing. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of data you're talking about there. So you must have uh, quite a lot of people internally working with you for you. Um, do you have a left field view on on how you pick up the people who work with you and come up with your investment ideas? Yeah, you know, so I mean, um, so we have a, we have a, we actually have a small team working with us, but we do uh, over the last few years we've been like sort of running an intern program with uh, a university that we have like an old historic connection with. And one of the things I find interesting when I've been sort of doing the hiring process for that is you know I'm a big believer in. Uh, recognizing when something didn't work just the way you wanted it and ways to improve it. So like when I first started to run this intern program, uh, we just get you know, 60 CVs. You read the CV and go, wow, this person's amazing. Then you, you meet them or you have a phone interview with them and go, ah, ah no, this is not really working for us. Uh, you know, and so you know, it was a complete waste of time. It was a lot of waste of time uh, in the whole process. And in a way, it didn't feel like uh, it really was giving, I think the CV is almost like, these days people are so good at polishing CVs that it, it just makes for a bad sort of, it doesn't really give you what you want as someone who's employing people. And the other thing as well, and I think this is a big problem in finance, is that the way finance hires, you have, a, people tend to have a tendency to hire uh, a younger version of themselves, which is not, always the optimal outcome. Yes. Um, and I think it may be subconscious or, or something like that. Um, and so what the process we now do in the hiring for the interns is what I ask them to do is send me 200 words on how they would invest a million pounds today. And I ask them not to put their name on it. I just want a, a mobile phone number and their initials. Uh, and then what we do is we get those, we print them out, I put them in a big pile, and I come over and I look at them and just quickly mark them and if they're like generic boring stuff, like on uh, equity bond allocation of 50-50 or something like that, I just throw them in the bin. Uh, you know, and looking for sort of interesting, good ideas. And the other thing we did with that process, we, we, we originally had exclusive for like economic undergrads, economic and finance undergrads. We opened up the whole university. Anyone, any undergrad could apply. And the process was by doing it that way, by this sort of blind, do you ever watch The Voice? Yes. Yes, of course. It's like that, all right? Can't see them, just listen to them, and then you go from there. And it's been a much better outcome, much more, uh, a much more sort of diverse uh, group of interns we've had. And the work they've done for me has been very, very good. I've been very pleased with it. Well, it's been great again talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, Lots of great stuff again there. Hopefully it won't be 18, 16, 18 months before the next time. Great. Thank you very much indeed. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. So there we have it. Russell's still looking at the shale patch. He's building his thesis that he started um, over a year ago. And he said it would take two years to really get to a level where he felt more comfortable with it. We also heard his thoughts on semiconductors and the US market as a whole, where he's clearly thinking that this is a market which has now run too far, but you know, the momentum issues are there. I also thought it was interesting that he's picked up on the autos, not just the US autos, but the global autos, a theme that we, we've seen before. So some really interesting stuff there. I, I loved his views on portfolio construction and also data and how he uses public data to build some of his big uh, investment ideas, stuff that we can all use. So hopefully, there was something in that that we can all take away and hopefully we can use ourselves in our own portfolio construction and investment themes.